the chambers of the mind and heart of the woman who was, physically touching her, were stood, like the treasures in the tombs of kings, tablets bearing sacred inscriptions, which, if one could spell them out, would teach one everything, but they would never be offered openly, never made public. What art was there, known to love or cunning, by which one pressed through into those secret chambers? What device for becoming, like waters poured into one jar, inextricably the same, one with the object one adored? Could the body achieve, or the mind, subtly mingling in the intricate passages of the brain, or the heart? Could loving, as people called it, make her and Mrs. Ramsay one? For it was not knowledge, but unity that she desired, not inscriptions on tablets, nothing that could be written in any language known to men, but intimacy itself, which is knowledge, she had thought, leaning her head on Mrs. Ramsay's knee. Nothing happened, nothing, nothing, as she leant her head against Mrs. Ramsay's knee. And yet, she knew knowledge and wisdom were stored up in Mrs. Ramsay's heart. How then, she had asked herself, did one know one thing or another thing about people, sealed as they were? Only like a bee, drawn by some sweetness or sharpness in the air, intangible to touch or taste, one haunted the dome-shaped hive, ranged the wastes of the air over the countries of the world alone, and then haunted the hives with their murmurs and their stirrings, the hives which were people. Mrs. Ramsay rose. Lily rose. Mrs. Ramsay went. For days there hung about her, as after a dream some subtle change is felt in the person one has dreamt of, more vividly than anything she said, the sound of murmuring. And, as she sat in the wicker armchair in the drawing-room window, she wore, to Lily's eyes, an august shape, the shape of a dome. This ray passed level with Mr. Banks's ray straight to Mrs. Ramsay, sitting reading there with James at her knee. But now, while she still looked, Mr. Banks had done. He had put on his spectacles. He had stepped back. He had raised his hand. He had slightly narrowed his clear blue eyes, when Lily, rousing herself, saw what he was at, and winced like a dog who sees a hand raised to strike it. She would have snatched her picture off the easel, but she said to herself, One must. She braced herself to stand the awful trial of someone looking at her picture. One must, she said, one must. And, if it must be seen, Mr. Banks was less alarming than another. But that any other eyes should see the residue of her thirty-three years, the deposit of each day's living mixed with something more secret than she had ever spoken or shown in the course of all those days, was an agony. At the same time, it was immensely exciting. Nothing could be cooler and quieter. Taking out a penknife, Mr. Banks tapped the canvas with the bone handle. What did she wish to indicate by the triangular purple shape, just there? he asked. It was Mrs. Ramsay reading to James, she said. She knew his objection, that no one could tell it for a human shape. But she had made no attempt at likeness, she said. For what reason had she introduced them, then? he asked. Why, indeed, except that, if there, in that corner, it was bright, here, in this, she felt the need of darkness. Simple, obvious, commonplace as it was, Mr. Banks was interested. Mother and child, then, objects of universal veneration, and in this case the mother was famous for her beauty, might be reduced, he pondered, to a purple shadow without irreverence. But the picture was not of them, she said, or not in his sense. There were other senses, too, in which one might reverence them. By a shadow here and a light there, for instance, her tribute took that form, if, as she vaguely supposed, a picture must be a tribute. A mother and child might be reduced to a shadow without irreverence. A light here required a shadow there. He considered, 
he was interested. He took it scientifically in complete good faith. The truth was that all his prejudices were on the other side, he explained. The largest picture in his dining room, which painters had praised and valued at a higher price than he had given for it, was of the cherry trees in blossom on the banks of the Kennet. He had spent his honeymoon on the banks of the Kennet, he said. Lily must come and see that picture, he said. But now, he turned, with his glasses raised, to the scientific examination of her canvas. The question being one of the relations of masses, of lights and shadows, which, to be honest, he had never considered before, he would like to have it explained. What, then, did she wish to make of it? And he indicated the scene before them. She looked. She could not show him what she wished to make of it, could not see it even herself, without a brush in her hand. She took up once more her old painting position, with the dim eyes and the absent-minded manner, subduing all her impressions as a woman to something much more general, becoming once more under the power of that vision which she had seen clearly once, and must now grope for among hedges and houses and mothers and children, her picture. It was a question, she remembered, how to connect this mass on the right hand with that on the left. She might do it by bringing the line of the branch across so, or break the vacancy in the foreground by an object, James perhaps, so. But the danger was that by doing that the unity of the whole might be broken. She stopped. She did not want to bore him. She took the canvas lightly off the easel. But it had been seen, it had been taken from her. This man had shared with her something profoundly intimate. And, thanking Mr. Ramsay for it, and Mrs. Ramsay for it, and the hour and the place, crediting the world with a power which she had not suspected, that one could walk away down that long gallery, not alone any more, but arm in arm with somebody, the strangest feeling in the world, and the most exhilarating. She nicked the catch of her paint-box, too, more firmly than was necessary, and the nick seemed to surround in a circle for ever the paint-box, the lawn, Mr. Banks, and that wild villain, Cam, dashing past. CHAPTER Ten. For Cam grazed the easel by an inch. She would not stop for Mr. Banks and Lily Briscoe, though Mr. Banks, who would have liked a daughter of his own, held out his hand. She would not stop for her father, whom she grazed also by an inch, nor for her mother, who called, "'Cam, I want you a moment,' as she dashed past. She was off like a bird, bullet or arrow, impelled by what desire, shot by whom, at what directed, who could say? What, what? Mrs. Ramsay pondered, watching her. It might be a vision, of a shell, of a wheelbarrow, of a fairy kingdom on the far side of the hedge, or it might be the glory of speed, no one knew. But when Mrs. Ramsay called, Cam, a second time, the projectile dropped in mid-career, and Cam came lagging back, pulling a leaf by the way, to her mother. What was she dreaming about, Mrs. Ramsay wondered seeing her engrossed, as she stood there with some thought of her own, so that she had to repeat the message twice, ask Mildred if Andrew, Miss Doyle, and Mr. Rayleigh have come back. The words seemed to be dropped into a well, where, if the waters were clear, they were also so extraordinarily distorting that, even as they descended, one saw them twisting about to make heaven knows what pattern on the floor of the child's mind. What message would Cam give the cook? Mrs. Ramsay wondered. And indeed it was only by waiting patiently, and hearing that there was an old woman in the kitchen with very red cheeks drinking soup out of a basin, that Mrs. Ramsay at last prompted that parrot-like instinct which had picked up Mildred's words quite accurately, and could now produce them, if one waited, in a colourless sing-song. Shifting from foot to foot, Cam repeated the words. No, they haven't, and I've told Ellen to clear away tea. Minter Doyle and Paul Rayleigh had not come back then. That could only mean, Mrs. Ramsay thought, one thing. She must accept him, or she must refuse him. This going off after luncheon for a walk, 
even though Andrew was with them, what could it mean? Except that she had decided, rightly, Mrs. Ramsay thought, and she was very, very fond of Minter, to accept that good fellow, who might not be brilliant. But then, thought Mrs. Ramsay, realising that James was tugging at her, to make her go on reading aloud the fisherman and his wife, she did in her own heart infinitely prefer boobies to clever men who wrote dissertations. Charles Tansley, for instance. Anyhow, it must have happened, one way or the other, by now. But she read. Next morning the wife awoke first, and it was just daybreak, and from her bed she saw the beautiful country lying before her. Her husband was still stretching himself. But how could Minta say now that she would not have him? Not if she agreed to spend whole afternoons traipsing about the country alone, for Andrew would be off after his crabs. But possibly Nancy was with them. She tried to recall the sight of them standing at the hall door after lunch. There they stood, looking at the sky, wondering about the weather, and she had said, thinking partly to cover their shyness, partly to encourage them to be off, for her sympathies were with Paul. There isn't a cloud anywhere within miles. At which she could feel little Charles Tansley, who had followed them out, snigger. But she did it on purpose. Whether Nancy was there or not, she could not be certain, looking from one to the other in her mind's eye. She read on. Our wife, said the man, why should we be king? I do not want to be king. Well, said the wife, if you won't be king, I will. Go to the flounder, for I will be king. Come in or go out, Cam, she said, knowing that Cam was attracted only by the word flounder, and that in a moment she would fidget and fight with James as usual. Cam shot off. Mrs. Ramsay went on reading, relieved, for she and James shared the same tastes and were comfortable together. And when he came to the sea, it was quite dark grey, and the water heaved up from below and smelt putrid. Then he went and stood by it and said, Flounder, flounder, in the sea, come I pray thee, hear to me, for my wife, good Ilzebil, wills not as I'd have her will. Well, what does she want then? said the flounder. Where were they now? Mrs. Ramsay wondered, reading and thinking quite easily both at the same time. For the story of the fisherman and his wife was like the bass gently accompanying a tune, which now and then ran up unexpectedly into the melody. And when should she be told? If nothing happened, she would have to speak seriously to Minta, for she could not go traipsing about all over the country, even if Nancy were with them. She tried again, unsuccessfully, to visualise their backs going down the path, and to count them. She was responsible to Minter's parents, the owl and the poker. Her nicknames for them shot into her mind as she read. The owl and the poker. Yes, they would be annoyed if they heard, and they were certain to hear, that Minter, staying with the Ramses, had been seen, etc., etc., etc. He wore a wig in the House of Commons, and she ably assisted him at the head of the stairs," she repeated, fishing them up out of her mind by a phrase which, coming back from some party, she had made to amuse her husband. "'Dear, dear,' Mrs. Ramsay said to herself, "'how did they produce this incongruous daughter, this tomboy minter with a hole in her stocking? How did she exist in that portentous atmosphere? where the maid was always removing in a dustpan the sand that the parrot had scattered, and conversation was almost entirely reduced to the exploits, interesting perhaps but limited after all, of that bird. Naturally one had asked her to lunch, tea, dinner, finally to stay with them up at Finlay, which had resulted in some friction with the owl, her mother, and more calling, and more conversation, and more sand, and really, at the end of it, she had told enough lies about parrots to last her a lifetime. So she had said to her husband that night, coming back from the party. However, Minta came. Yes, she came, Mrs. Ramsay thought, suspecting some thorn in the tangle of this thought, and disengaging it, found it to be this. A woman had once accused her of robbing her of her daughter's affections. Something Mrs. Doyle had said made her remember that charge again. 
wishing to dominate, wishing to interfere, making people do what she wished. That was the charge against her, and she thought it most unjust. How could she help being like that to look at? No one could accuse her of taking pains to impress. She was often ashamed of her own shabbiness. Nor was she domineering, nor was she tyrannical. It was more true about hospitals and drains and the dairy. About things like that she did feel passionately, and would, if she had the chance, have liked to take people by the scruff of their necks and make them see. No hospital on the whole island. It was a disgrace. Milk delivered at your door in London positively brown with dirt. It should be made illegal. A model dairy and a hospital up here, those two things she would have liked to do herself. But how? With all these children? When they were older, then perhaps she would have time, when they were all at school. Oh, but she never wanted James to grow a day older, or Cam either. These two she would have liked to keep forever just as they were, demons of wickedness, angels of delight, never to see them grow up into long-legged monsters. Nothing made up for the loss. When she read just now to James, and there were numbers of soldiers with kettle drums and trumpets, and his eyes darkened, she thought, why should they grow up and lose all that? He was the most gifted, the most sensitive of her children. But all, she thought, were full of promise. Prue, a perfect angel with the others, and sometimes now, at night especially, she took one's breath away with her beauty. Andrew, even her husband admitted that his gift for mathematics was extraordinary. And Nancy and Roger, they were both wild creatures now, scampering about over the country all day long. As for Rose, her mouth was too big, but she had a wonderful gift with her hands. If they had charades, Rose made the dresses, made everything, liked best arranging tables, flowers, anything. She did not like it that Jasper should shoot birds, but it was only a stage. They all went through stages. Why, she asked, pressing her chin on James's head, should they grow up so fast? Why should they go to school? She would have liked always to have had a baby. She was happiest carrying one in her arms. Then people might say she was tyrannical, domineering, masterful, if they chose. She did not mind. And, touching his hair with her lips, she thought, he will never be so happy again, but stopped herself, remembering how it angered her husband that she should say that. Still, it was true. They were happier now than they would ever be again. A tenpenny tea set made Cam happy for days. She heard them stamping and crowing on the floor above her head the moment they awoke. They came bustling along the passage. Then the door sprang open and in they came, fresh as roses, staring, wide awake, as if this coming into the dining room after breakfast, which they did every day of their lives, was a positive event to them. And so on, with one thing after another, all day long, until she went up to say good-night to them, and found them netted in their cots like birds among cherries and raspberries, still making up stories about some little bit of rubbish, something they had heard, something they had picked up in the garden. They all had their little treasures. And so she went down and said to her husband, Why must they grow up and lose it all? Never will they be so happy again. And he was angry. Why take such a gloomy view of life, he said. It is not sensible. For it was odd, and she believed it to be true, that with all his gloom and desperation he was happier, more hopeful on the whole, than she was. Less exposed to human worries, perhaps that was it. He always had his work to fall back on. Not that she herself was pessimistic, as he accused her of being. Only she thought life, and a little strip of time presented itself to her eyes, her fifty years. There it was before her, life. Life, she thought. But she did not finish her thought. She took a look at life, for she had a clear sense of it there, something real, something private, which she shared neither with her children nor with her husband. A sort of transaction went on between them, 
in which she was on one side and life was on another, and she was always trying to get the better of it, as it was of her, and sometimes they parleyed when she sat there alone. There were, she remembered, great reconciliation scenes, but for the most part, oddly enough, she must admit that she felt this thing she called life terrible, hostile, and quick to pounce on you if you gave it a chance. There were eternal problems, suffering, death, the poor. There was always a woman dying of cancer, even here. And yet, she had said to all these children, you shall go through it all. To eight people she had said relentlessly that, and the bill for the greenhouse would be fifty pounds. For that reason, knowing what was before them, love and ambition and being wretched alone in dreary places, she had often the feeling, why must they grow up and lose it all? And then she said to herself, brandishing her sword at life, nonsense, they will be perfectly happy. And here she was, she reflected, feeling life rather sinister again, making Minter marry Paul Rayleigh, because, whatever she might feel about her own transaction, she had had experiences which need not happen to every one. She did not name them to herself. She was driven on, too quickly she knew, almost as if it were an escape for her too, to say that people must marry, people must have children. Was she wrong in this, she asked herself, reviewing her conduct for the past week or two, and wondering if she had indeed put any pressure upon Minta, who was only twenty-four, to make up her mind. She was uneasy. Had she not laughed about it? Was she not forgetting again how strongly she influenced people? Marriage needed oh, all sorts of qualities. The bill for the greenhouse would be fifty pounds. One, she need not name it, that was essential, the thing she had with her husband. Had they that? Then he put on his trousers and ran away like a madman, she read. But outside a great storm was raging and blowing so hard that he could scarcely keep his feet. Houses and trees toppled over, the mountains trembled, rocks rolled into the sea, the sky was pitch black, and it thundered and lightened, and the sea came in with black waves as high as church towers and mountains, and all with white foam at the top. She turned the page, there were only a few lines more, so that she would finish the story, though it was past bedtime. It was getting late. The light in the garden told her that, and the whitening of the flowers and something grey in the leaves conspired together to rouse in her a feeling of anxiety. What it was about she could not think at first. Then she remembered. Paul and Minta and Andrew had not come back. She summoned before her again the little group on the terrace in front of the hall door, standing looking up into the sky. Andrew had his net and basket. That meant he was going to catch crabs and things. That meant he would climb out onto a rock, he would be cut off. Or coming back single file on one of those little paths above the cliff, one of them might slip. He would roll and then crash. It was growing quite dark. But she did not let her voice change in the least as she finished the story, and added, shutting the book, and speaking the last words as if she had made them up herself, looking into James's eyes. And there they are, living still, at this very time. And that's the end, she said, and she saw in his eyes, as the interest of the story died away in them, something else take its place, something wandering, pale, like the reflection of a light, which had once made him gaze and marvel. Turning, she looked across the bay, and there, sure enough, coming regularly across the waves, first two quick strokes, and then one long, steady stroke, was the light of the lighthouse. It had been lit. In a moment he would ask her, Are we going to the lighthouse? And she would have to say, No, not tomorrow. Your father says not. Happily, Mildred came in to fetch them, and the bustle distracted them. But he kept looking back over his shoulder as Mildred carried him out, and she was certain that he was thinking, We are not going to the lighthouse tomorrow, and she thought, He will remember that all his life. End of section four.
Section 5 of To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. Chapter 11 No, she thought, putting together some of the pictures he had cut out, a refrigerator, a mowing machine, a gentleman in evening dress. Children never forget. For this reason it was so important what one said, and what one did, and it was a relief when they went to bed. For now she need not think about anybody. She could be herself, by herself. And that was what now she often felt the need of, to think. Well, not even to think. To be silent, to be alone. All the being and the doing, expansive, glittering, vocal, evaporated, and one shrunk, with a sense of solemnity, to being oneself, a wedge-shaped core of darkness, something invisible to others. Although she continued to knit and sat upright, it was thus that she felt herself. And this self, having shed its attachments, was free for the strangest adventures. When life sank down for a moment, the range of experience seemed limitless. And to everybody there was always this sense of unlimited resources, she supposed, one after another, she, Lily, Augustus Carmichael, must feel, our apparitions, the things you know us by, are simply childish. Beneath it is all dark, it is all spreading, it is unfathomably deep. But now and again we rise to the surface, and that is what you see us by. Her horizon seemed to her limitless. There were all the places she had not seen, the Indian plains, she felt herself pushing aside the thick leather curtain of a church in Rome. This core of darkness could go anywhere, for no one saw it. They could not stop it, she thought, exulting. There was freedom. There was peace. There was, most welcome of all, a summoning together, a resting on a platform of stability. Not as one's self did one find rest ever, in her experience. She accomplished here something dexterous with her needles, but as a wedge of darkness. Losing personality, one lost the fret, the hurry, the stir, and there rose to her lips always some exclamation of triumph over life, when things came together in this peace, this rest, this eternity. And pausing there, she looked out to meet that stroke of the lighthouse, the long, steady stroke, the last of the three, which was her stroke, for watching them in this mood always at this hour, one could not help attaching oneself to one thing especially of the things one saw, and this thing, the long steady stroke, was her stroke. Often she found herself sitting and looking, sitting and looking, with her work in her hands, until she became the thing she looked at, that light for example, and it would lift up on it some little phrase or other which had been lying in her mind like that, children don't forget, children don't forget which she would repeat and begin adding to it. It will end, it will end, she said. It will come, it will come. When suddenly she added, we are in the hands of the Lord. But instantly she was annoyed with herself for saying that. Who had said it? Not she. She had been trapped into saying something she did not mean. She looked up over her knitting and met the third stroke and it seemed to her like her own eyes meeting her own eyes, searching as she alone could search into her mind and her heart, purifying out of existence that lie, any lie. She praised herself in praising the light, without vanity, for she was stern, she was searching, she was beautiful like that light. It was odd, she thought, how, if one was alone, one lent to inanimate things, trees, streams, flowers, felt they expressed one, felt they became one, felt they knew one, in a sense were one, felt an irrational tenderness thus. She looked at that long steady light, as for oneself. There rose, and she looked and looked with her needles suspended, there curled up off the floor of the mind, rose from the lake of one's being a mist, a bride to meet her lover. What brought her to say that, 
we are in the hands of the Lord, she wondered. The insincerity slipping in among the truths roused her, annoyed her. She returned to her knitting again. How could any Lord have made this world? she asked. With her mind she had always seized the fact that there is no reason, order, justice, but suffering, death, the poor. There was no treachery too base for the world to commit, she knew that. No happiness lasted, she knew that. She knitted with firm composure, slightly pursing her lips, and, without being aware of it, so stiffened and composed the lines of her face in a habit of sternness, that when her husband passed, though he was chuckling at the thought that Hume, the philosopher, grown enormously fat, had stuck in a bog, he could not help noting, as he passed, the sternness at the heart of her beauty. It saddened him, and her remoteness pained him, and he felt, as he passed, that he could not protect her, and, when he reached the hedge, he was sad. He could do nothing to help her. He must stand by and watch her. Indeed, the infernal truth was, he made things worse for her. He was irritable, he was touchy, he had lost his temper over the lighthouse. He looked into the hedge, into its intricacy, its darkness. Always, Mrs. Ramsay felt, one helped oneself out of solitude reluctantly, by laying hold of some little odd or end, some sound, some sight. She listened, but it was all very still. Cricket was over, the children were in their baths, there was only the sound of the sea. She stopped knitting. She held the long, reddish-brown stocking dangling in her hands a moment. She saw the light again. With some irony in her interrogation, for when one woke at all one's relations changed, she looked at the steady light, the pitiless, the remorseless, which was so much her, yet so little her, which had her at its beck and call. She woke in the night and saw it bent across their bed, stroking the floor. But for all that, she thought, watching it with fascination, hypnotized, as if it were stroking with its silver fingers some sealed vessel in her brain, whose bursting would flutter with delight, she had known happiness, exquisite happiness, intense happiness, and it silvered the rough waves a little more brightly, as daylight faded, and the blue went out of the sea, and it rolled in waves of pure lemon, which curved and swelled and broke upon the beach, and the ecstasy burst in her eyes, and waves of pure delight raced over the floor of her mind, and she felt, it is enough, it is enough. He turned and saw her. Ah, she was lovely, lovelier now than ever, he thought. But he could not speak to her. He could not interrupt her. He wanted urgently to speak to her now that James was gone and she was alone at last. But he resolved, no, he would not interrupt her. She was aloof from him now in her beauty, in her sadness. He would let her be, and he passed her without a word, though it hurt him that she should look so distant and he could not reach her, he could do nothing to help her. And again he would have passed her without a word, had she not, at that very moment, given him of her own free will what she knew he would never ask, and called to him and taken the green shawl off the picture frame and gone to him, for he wished, she knew, to protect her. Chapter 12 She folded the green shawl about her shoulders. She took his arm. His beauty was so great, she said, beginning to speak of Kennedy the gardener, at once he was so awfully handsome that she couldn't dismiss him. There was a ladder against the greenhouse, and little lumps of putty stuck about, for they were beginning to mend the greenhouse. Yes, but as she strolled along with her husband, she felt that that particular source of worry had been placed. She had it on the tip of her tongue to say, as they strolled, it'll cost fifty pounds. But instead, for her heart failed her about money. She talked about Jasper shooting birds, and he said, at once, soothing her instantly, that it was natural in a boy, and he trusted he would find better ways of amusing himself before long. Her 
husband was so sensible, so just. And so she said, Yes, all children go through stages, and began considering the dahlias in the big bed, and wondering what about next year's flowers, and had he heard the children's nickname for Charles Tansley, she asked. The atheist, they called him, the little atheist. He's not a polished specimen, said Mr. Ramsay. Far from it, said Mrs. Ramsay. She supposed it was all right leaving him to his own devices, Mrs. Ramsay said, wondering whether it was any use sending down bulbs. Did they plant them? Oh, he has his dissertation to write, said Mr. Ramsay. She knew all about that, said Mrs. Ramsay. He talked of nothing else. It was about the influence of somebody upon something. Well, it's all he has to count on, said Mr. Ramsay. Pray heaven he won't fall in love with Prue, said Mrs. Ramsay. He'd disinherit her if she married him, said Mr. Ramsay. He did not look at the flowers which his wife was considering, but at a spot about a foot or so above them. There was no harm in him, he added, and was just about to say that anyhow he was the only young man in England who admired his, when he choked it back. He would not bother her again about his books. These flowers seemed creditable, Mr. Ramsay said, lowering his gaze and noticing something red, something brown. Yes, but then these she had put in with her own hands, said Mrs. Ramsay. The question was, what happened if she sent bulbs down? Did Kennedy plant them? It was his incurable laziness, she added, moving on. If she stood over him all day long with a spade in her hand, he did sometimes do a stroke of work. So they strolled along towards the red-hot pokers. "'You're teaching your daughters to exaggerate,' said Mr. Ramsay, reproving her. Her Aunt Camilla was far worse than she was, Mrs. Ramsay remarked. "'Nobody ever held up your Aunt Camilla as a model of virtue that I'm aware of,' said Mr. Ramsay. "'She was the most beautiful woman I ever saw,' said Mrs. Ramsay. "'Somebody else was that,' said Mr. Ramsay. Prue was going to be far more beautiful than she was, said Mrs. Ramsay. He saw no trace of it, said Mr. Ramsay. Well then, look tonight, said Mrs. Ramsay. They caused. He wished Andrew could be induced to work harder. He would lose every chance of a scholarship if he didn't. Oh, scholarships, she said. Mr. Ramsay thought her foolish for saying that, about a serious thing like a scholarship. He should be very proud of Andrew if he got a scholarship, he said. She would be just as proud of him if he didn't, she answered. They disagreed always about this, but it did not matter. She liked him to believe in scholarships, and he liked her to be proud of Andrew whatever he did. Suddenly she remembered those little paths on the edge of the cliffs. Wasn't it late? she asked. They hadn't come home yet. He flicked his watch carelessly open but it was only just past seven. He held his watch open for a moment, deciding that he would tell her what he had felt on the terrace. To begin with, it was not reasonable to be so nervous. Andrew could look after himself. Then, he wanted to tell her that when he was walking on the terrace just now. Here he became uncomfortable, as if he were breaking into that solitude, that aloofness, that remoteness of hers. But she pressed him. What had he wanted to tell her, she asked, thinking it was about going to the lighthouse, that he was sorry he had said, damn you. But no, he did not like to see her look so sad, he said. Only wool-gathering, she protested, flushing a little. They both felt uncomfortable, as if they did not know whether to go on or go back. She had been reading fairy tales to James, she said. No, they could not share that. They could not say that. They had reached the gap between the two clumps of red-hot pokers, and there was the lighthouse again, but she would not let herself look at it. Had she known that he was looking at her, she thought, she would not have let herself sit there thinking. She disliked anything that reminded her that she had been seen sitting thinking. So she looked over her shoulder at the town. The lights were rippling and running as if they were drops of silver water held firm in a wind. 
and all the poverty, all the suffering had turned to that, Mrs. Ramsay thought. The lights of the town, and of the harbour, and of the boats, seemed like a phantom net floating there to mark something which had sunk. Well, if he could not share her thoughts, Mr. Ramsay said to himself, he would be off then, on his own. He wanted to go on thinking, telling himself the story how Hume was stuck in a bog, he wanted to laugh. But first it was nonsense to be anxious about Andrew. When he was Andrew's age, he used to walk about the country all day long, with nothing but a biscuit in his pocket, and nobody bothered about him or thought that he had fallen over a cliff. He said aloud he thought he would be off for a day's walk, if the weather held. He had had about enough of Banks and of Carmichael. He would like a little solitude. Yes, she said. It annoyed him that she did not protest. She knew that he would never do it. He was too old now to walk all day long with a biscuit in his pocket. She worried about the boys, but not about him. Years ago, before he had married, he thought, looking across the bay, as they stood between the clumps of red-hot pokers, he had walked all day. He had made a meal of bread and cheese in a public house. He had worked ten hours at a stretch. An old woman just popped her head in now and again and saw to the fire. That was the country he liked best, over there, those sand hills dwindling away into darkness. One could walk all day without meeting a soul. There was not a house scarcely, not a single village for miles on end. One could worry things out alone. There were little sandy beaches where no one had been since the beginning of time. The seals sat up and looked at you. It sometimes seemed to him that in a little house out there, alone, he broke off sighing. He had no right. The father of eight children, he reminded himself. And he would have been a beast and a cur to wish a single thing altered. Andrew would be a better man than he had been. Prue would be a beauty, her mother said. They would stem the flood a bit. That was a good bit of work on the whole, his eight children. They showed he did not damn the poor little universe entirely. For, on an evening like this, he thought, looking at the land dwindling away, the little island seemed pathetically small, half swallowed up in the sea. Poor little place, he murmured with a sigh. She heard him. He said the most melancholy things, but she noticed that directly he had said them, he always seemed more cheerful than usual. All this phrase-making was a game, she thought, for if she had said half what he said, she would have blown her brains out by now. It annoyed her, this phrase-making, and she said to him, in a matter-of-fact way, that it was a perfectly lovely evening. And what was he groaning about, she asked, half laughing, half complaining, for she guessed what he was thinking. He would have written better books if he had not married. He was not complaining, he said. She knew that he did not complain. She knew that he had nothing whatever to complain of. And he seized her hand and raised it to his lips, and kissed it with an intensity that brought the tears to her eyes, and quickly he dropped it. They turned away from the view and began to walk up the path where the silver-green spear-like plants grew, arm in arm. His arm was almost like a young man's arm, Mrs. Ramsay thought, thin and hard, and she thought with delight how strong he still was, though he was over sixty, and how untamed and optimistic, and how strange it was that being convinced, as he was, of all sorts of horrors, seemed not to depress him, but to cheer him. Was it not odd? she reflected. Indeed, he seemed to her sometimes made differently from other people born blind, deaf, and dumb to the ordinary things, but to the extraordinary things, with an eye like an eagle's. His understanding often astonished her. But did he notice the flowers? No. Did he notice the view? No. Did he even notice his own daughter's beauty, or whether there was pudding on his plate or roast beef? He would sit at table with them like a person in a dream and his habit of talking aloud, or saying poetry aloud, was growing on him, she was afraid, for sometimes it was awkward. Best and brightest come away. 
poor Miss Giddings, when he shouted that at her, almost jumped out of her skin. But then, Mrs. Ramsay, though instantly taking his side against all the silly Giddingses in the world, then, she thought, intimating by a little pressure on his arm that he walked uphill too fast for her, and she must stop for a moment to see whether those were fresh molehills on the bank. Then, she thought, stooping down to look, a great mind like his must be different in every way from ours. All the great men she had ever known, she thought, deciding that a rabbit must have got in, were like that, and it was good for young men, though the atmosphere of lecture rooms was stuffy and depressing to her beyond endurance almost, simply to hear him, simply to look at him. But without shooting rabbits, how was one to keep them down, she wondered. It might be a rabbit, it might be a mole. Some creature anyhow was ruining her evening primroses. And looking up, she saw above the thin trees the first pulse of the full throbbing star, and wanted to make her husband look at it, for the sight gave her such keen pleasure. But she stopped herself. He never looked at things. If he did, all he would say would be, poor little world, with one of his sighs. At that moment he said, very fine, to please her, and pretended to admire the flowers. But she knew quite well that he did not admire them, or even realise that they were there. It was only to please her. Ah, but was that not Lily Briscoe strolling along with William Banks? She focused her short-sighted eyes upon the backs of a retreating couple. Yes, indeed it was. Did that not mean that they would marry? Yes, it must. What an admirable idea! They must marry. Chapter 13 He had been to Amsterdam, Mr. Banks was saying, as he strolled across the lawn with Lily Briscoe. He had seen the Rembrandts. He had been to Madrid. Unfortunately, it was Good Friday and the Prado was shut. He had been to Rome. Had Miss Briscoe never been to Rome? Oh, she should. It would be a wonderful experience for her. The Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo, and Padua with its Giottos. His wife had been in bad health for many years, so that their sightseeing had been on a modest scale. She had been to Brussels. She had been to Paris, but only for a flying visit to see an aunt who was ill. She had been to Dresden. There were masses of pictures she had not seen. However, Lily Briscoe reflected, Perhaps it was better not to see pictures, they only made one hopelessly discontented with one's own work. Mr. Banks thought one could carry that point of view too far. We can't all be Titians, and we can't all be Darwins, he said. At the same time he doubted whether you could have your Darwin and your Titian if it weren't for humble people like ourselves. Lily would have liked to pay him a compliment. You're not humble, Mr. Banks, she would have liked to have said. But he did not want compliments. Most men do, she thought. And she was a little ashamed of her impulse and said nothing, while he remarked that perhaps what he was saying did not apply to pictures. Anyhow, said Lily, tossing off her little insincerity, she would always go on painting because it interested her. Yes, said Mr. Banks, he was sure she would. And, as they reached the end of the lawn, he was asking her whether she had difficulty in finding subjects in London, when they turned and saw the Ramses. So that is marriage, Lily thought, a man and a woman looking at a girl throwing a ball. That is what Mrs. Ramsay tried to tell me the other night, she thought. For she was wearing a green shawl, and they were standing close together, watching Prue and Jasper throwing catches. And suddenly the meaning which, for no reason at all, as perhaps they are stepping out of the tube or ringing a doorbell, descends on people, making them symbolical, making them representative, came upon them, and made them in the dusk standing, looking, the symbols of marriage, husband and wife. Then, after an instant, the symbolical outline which transcended the real figures sank down again, and they became, as they met them, Mr. and Mrs. Ramsay watching the children throwing catches. But still, for a moment, though Mrs. Ramsay greeted them with her usual smile, oh, 
she's thinking we're going to get married, Lily thought, and said, I have triumphed tonight, meaning that for once Mr. Banks had agreed to dine with them, and not run off to his own lodging where his man cooked vegetables properly. Still, for one moment, there was a sense of things having been blown apart, of space, of irresponsibility as the ball soared high, and they followed it, and lost it, and saw the one star and the draped branches. In the failing light they all looked sharp-edged and ethereal, and divided by great distances. Then, darting backwards over the vast space, for it seemed as if solidity had vanished altogether, Prue ran full tilt into them, and caught the ball brilliantly high up in her left hand, and her mother said, "'Haven't they come back yet?' whereupon the spell was broken. Mr. Ramsay felt free now to laugh out loud, at the thought that Hume had stuck in a bog, and an old woman rescued him on condition he said the Lord's Prayer, and chuckling to himself he strolled off to his study. Mrs. Ramsay, bringing Prue back into throwing catches again, from which she had escaped, asked, "'Did Nancy go with them?' End of section 5 Section six of To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. Chapter fourteen. Certainly Nancy had gone with them, since Minta Doyle had asked it with her dumb look, holding out her hand, as Nancy made off after lunch to her attic, to escape the horror of family life. She supposed she must go then. She did not want to go. She did not want to be drawn into it all. For as they walked along the road to the cliff, Minta kept on taking her hand. Then she would let it go. Then she would take it again. What was it she wanted, Nancy asked herself. There was something, of course, that people wanted. For when Minta took her hand and held it, Nancy, reluctantly, saw the whole world spread out beneath her, as if it were Constantinople seen through a mist, and then, However heavy-eyed one might be, one must needs ask, Is that Santa Sophia? Is that the Golden Horn? So Nancy asked, when Minta took her hand, What is it that she wants? Is it that? And what was that? Here and there emerged from the mist, as Nancy looked down upon life spread beneath her, a pinnacle, a dome, prominent things without names. But when Minta dropped her hand, as she did when they ran down the hillside, all that, the dome, the pinnacle, whatever it was that had protruded through the mist, sank down into it and disappeared. Minta, Andrew observed, was rather a good walker. She wore more sensible clothes than most women. She wore very short skirts and black knickerbockers. She would jump straight into a stream and flounder across. He liked her rashness, but he saw that it would not do. She would kill herself in some idiotic way one of these days. She seemed to be afraid of nothing, except bulls. At the mere sight of a bull in a field, she would throw up her arms and fly screaming, which was the very thing to enrage a bull, of course. But she did not mind owning up to it in the least, one must admit that. She knew she was an awful coward about bulls, she said. She thought she must have been tossed in her perambulator when she was a baby. She didn't seem to mind what she said or did. Suddenly now she pitched down on the edge of the cliff, and began to sing some song about, Damn your eyes! Damn your eyes! They all had to join in and sing the chorus and shout out together, Damn your eyes! Damn your eyes! But it would be fatal to let the tide come in and cover up all the good hunting grounds before they got onto the beach. Fatal, Paul agreed, springing up, and as they went slithering down, he kept quoting the guidebook about these islands being justly celebrated for their park like prospects and the extent and variety of their marine curiosities. But it would not do altogether, this shouting and damning your eyes, Andrew felt, picking his way down the cliff this clapping him on the back and calling him old fellow, and all that, it would not altogether do. It was the worst of taking women on walks. Once on the beach they separated, 
he going out onto the Pope's nose, taking his shoes off and rolling his socks in them, and letting that couple look after themselves. Nancy waded out to her own rocks, and searched her own pools, and let that couple look after themselves. She crouched low down and touched the smooth rubber-like sea anemones, who were stuck like lumps of jelly to the side of the rock. Brooding, she changed the pool into the sea, and made the minnows into sharks and whales, and cast vast clouds over this tiny world by holding her hand against the sun, and so brought darkness and desolation, like God himself, to millions of ignorant and innocent creatures, and then took her hand away suddenly and let the sun stream down. Out on the pale criss-crossed sand, high-stepping, fringed, gauntleted, stalked some fantastic leviathan, she was still enlarging the pool, and slipped into the vast fissures of the mountainside. And then, letting her eyes slide imperceptibly above the pool, and rest on that wavering line of sea and sky, on the tree trunks which the smoke of steamers made waver on the horizon, she became with all that power sweeping savagely in and inevitably withdrawing, hypnotized, and the two senses of that vastness and this tininess, the pool had diminished again, flowering within it, made her feel that she was bound hand and foot, and unable to move by the intensity of feelings which reduced her own body, her own life, and the lives of all the people in the world, for ever, to nothingness. So, listening to the waves, crouching over the pool, she brooded. And Andrew shouted that the sea was coming in, so she leapt splashing through the shallow waves onto the shore, and ran up the beach and was carried by her own impetuosity, and her desire for rapid movement right behind a rock, and there, oh heavens, in each other's arms, were Paul and Minta kissing, probably. She was outraged, indignant. She and Andrew put on their shoes and stockings in dead silence, without saying a thing about it. Indeed, they were rather sharp with each other. She might have called him when she saw the crayfish or whatever it was, Andrew grumbled. However, they both felt, it's not our fault. They had not wanted this horrid nuisance to happen. All the same it irritated Andrew that Nancy should be a woman, and Nancy that Andrew should be a man, and they tied their shoes very neatly and drew the bows rather tight. It was not until they had climbed right up onto the top of the cliff again that Minta cried out that she had lost her grandmother's brooch, her grandmother's brooch, the sole ornament she possessed, a weeping willow. It was, they must remember it, set in pearls. They must have seen it, she said with the tears running down her cheeks, the brooch which her grandmother had fastened her cap with till the last day of her life. Now she had lost it. She would rather have lost anything than that. She would go back and look for it. They all went back. They poked and peered and looked. They kept their heads very low and said things shortly and gruffly. Paul Rayleigh searched like a madman all about the rock where they had been sitting. All this pother about a brooch really didn't do at all, Andrew thought, as Paul told him to make a thorough search between this point and that. The tide was coming in fast. The sea would cover the place where they had sat in a minute. There was not a ghost of a chance of their finding it now. We shall be cut off, Minta shrieked, suddenly terrified as if there were any danger of that. It was the same as the bulls all over again. She had no control over her emotions, Andrew thought. Women hadn't. The wretched Paul had to pacify her. The men, Andrew and Paul at once became manly and different from usual, took counsel briefly, and decided that they would plant Rayleigh's stick where they had sat, and come back at low tide again. There was nothing more that could be done now. If the brooch was there, it would still be there in the morning, they assured her, but Minta still sobbed, all the way up to the top of the cliff. It was her grandmother's brooch. She would rather have lost anything but that. And yet Nancy felt it might be true that she minded losing her brooch, but she wasn't crying only for that. She was crying for something else. We might all sit down and cry, she felt. 
but she did not know what for. They drew ahead together, Paul and Minta, and he comforted her and said how famous he was for finding things. Once, when he was a little boy, he had found a gold watch. He would get up at daybreak, and he was positive he would find it. It seemed to him that it would be almost dark, and he would be alone on the beach, and somehow it would be rather dangerous. He began telling her, however, that he would certainly find it, and she said that she would not hear of his getting up at dawn. It was lost. She knew that. She had had a presentiment when she put it on that afternoon. And secretly he resolved that he would not tell her, but he would slip out of the house at dawn when they were all asleep, and if he could not find it, he would go to Edinburgh and buy her another, just like it but more beautiful. He would prove what he could do. And, as they came out on the hill, and saw the lights of the town beneath them, the lights coming out suddenly, one by one, seemed like things that were going to happen to him, his marriage, his children, his house. And again he thought, as they came out onto the high road, which was shaded with high bushes, how they would retreat into solitude together, and walk on and on, he always leading her, and she pressing close to his side, as she did now. As they turned by the crossroads, he thought what an appalling experience he had been through, and he must tell someone. Mrs. Ramsay, of course, for it took his breath away to think what he had been and done. It had been far and away the worst moment of his life when he asked Minter to marry him. He would go straight to Mrs. Ramsay, because he felt somehow that she was the person who had made him do it. She had made him think he could do anything. Nobody else took him seriously. But she made him believe that he could do whatever he wanted. He had felt her eyes on him all day today, following him about, though she never said a word, as if she were saying, Yes, you can do it. I believe in you. I expect it of you. She had made him feel all that, and directly they got back, he looked for the lights of the house above the bay. He would go to her and say, I've done it, Mrs. Ramsay, thanks to you. And so, turning into the lane that led to the house, he could see lights moving about in the upper windows. They must be awfully late then. People were getting ready for dinner. The house was all lit up, and the lights after the darkness made his eyes feel full, and he said to himself, childishly, as he walked up the drive, lights, 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 and repeated in a dazed way, lights, 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 as they came into the house, staring about him with his face quite stiff. But, good heavens, he said to himself, putting his hand to his tie, I must not make a fool of myself. Chapter 15 Yes, said Prue in her considering way, answering her mother's question. I think Nancy did go with them. Chapter 16 Well then, Nancy had gone with them, Mrs. Ramsay supposed, wondering, as she put down a brush, took up a comb, and said, Come in, to a tap at the door. Jasper and Rose came in. Whether the fact that Nancy was with them made it less likely or more likely that anything would happen. It made it less likely somehow, Mrs. Ramsay thought, very irrationally except that after all holocaust on such a scale was not probable. They could not all be drowned. And again she felt alone in the presence of her old antagonist, life. Jasper and Rose said that Mildred wanted to know whether she should wait dinner. Not for the Queen of England, said Mrs. Ramsay emphatically. Not for the Empress of Mexico, she added, laughing at Jasper, for he shared his mother's vice. He too exaggerated. And if Rose liked, she said, while Jasper took the message, she might choose which jewels she was to wear. When there are fifteen people sitting down to dinner, one cannot keep things waiting forever. She was now beginning to feel annoyed with them for being so late. It was inconsiderate of them, and it annoyed her on top of her anxiety about them, that they should choose this very night to be out late, when in fact she wished the dinner to be particularly nice since William Banks had at last consented to dine with them, and they were having Mildred's masterpiece, Buffon d'Orbe. 
everything depended upon things being served up to the precise moment they were ready. The beef, the bay leaf, and the wine all must be done to a turn. To keep it waiting was out of the question. Yet of course tonight, of all nights, out they went, and they came in late, and things had to be sent out, things had to be kept hot. The boeuf on daub would be entirely spoilt. Jasper offered her an opal necklace, Rose a gold necklace, which looked best against her black dress. Which did indeed, said Mrs. Ramsay absent-mindedly, looking at her neck and shoulders, but avoiding her face, in the glass. And then, while the children rummaged among her things, she looked out of the window at a sight which always amused her, the rooks trying to decide which tree to settle on. Every time they seemed to change their minds and rose up into the air again, because, she thought, the old rook, the father rook, old Joseph was her name for him, was a bird of a very trying and difficult disposition. He was a disreputable old bird, with half his wing feathers missing. He was like some seedy old gentleman in a top hat she had seen playing the horn in front of a public house. Look, she said, laughing. They were actually fighting. Joseph and Mary were fighting. Anyhow, they all went up again, and the air was shoved aside by their black wings and cut into exquisite scimitar shapes. The movements of the wings beating out, 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 she could never describe it accurately enough to please herself, was one of the loveliest of all to her. Look at that, she said to Rose, hoping that Rose would see it more clearly than she could for one's children so often gave one's own perceptions a little thrust forwards. But which was it to be? They had all the trays of her jewel-case open. The gold necklace, which was Italian, or the opal necklace, which Uncle James had brought her from India, or should she wear her amethysts? "'Choose, dearests, choose,' she said, hoping that they would make haste. But she let them take their time to choose. She let Rose, particularly, take up this and then that, and hold her jewels against the black dress, for this little ceremony of choosing jewels, which was gone through every night, was what Rose liked best, she knew. She had some hidden reason of her own for attaching great importance to this choosing what her mother was to wear. What was the reason, Mrs. Ramsay wondered, standing still to let her clasp the necklace she had chosen, divining, through her own past, some deep, some buried, some quite speechless feeling that one had for one's mother at Rose's age. Like all feelings felt for oneself, Mrs. Ramsay thought, it made one sad. It was so inadequate what one could give in return, and what Rose felt was quite out of proportion to anything she actually was. And Rose would grow up, and Rose would suffer, she supposed, with these deep feelings, and she said she was ready now, and they would go down, and Jasper, because he was the gentleman, should give her his arm, and Rose, as she was the lady, should carry her handkerchief. She gave her the handkerchief. And what else? Oh yes, it might be cold, a shawl. Choose me a shawl, she said, for that would please Rose, who was bound to suffer so. There, she said, stopping by the window on the landing. There they are again. Joseph had settled on another treetop. "'Don't you think they mind?' she said to Jasper. "'Having their wings broken?' Why did he want to shoot poor old Joseph and Mary? He shuffled a little on the stairs and felt rebuked, but not seriously, for she did not understand the fun of shooting birds. And they did not feel, and being his mother she lived away in another division of the world, and he rather liked her stories about Mary and Joseph. She made him laugh. But how did she know that those were Mary and Joseph? Did she think the same birds came to the same trees every night? he asked. But here, suddenly, like all grown-up people, she ceased to pay him the least attention. She was listening to a clatter in the hall. They've come back, she exclaimed, and at once she felt much more annoyed with them than relieved. Then she wondered, had it happened? She would go down, and they would tell her. But no, they could not tell her anything with all these people about. So she must go down and begin dinner and wait. And, like
like some queen who, finding her people gathered in the hall, looks down upon them and descends among them, and acknowledges their tributes silently, and accepts their devotion and their prostration before her. Paul did not move a muscle, but looked straight before him as she passed. She went down and crossed the hall, and bowed her head very slightly, as if she accepted what they could not say, their tribute to her beauty. But she stopped. There was a smell of burning. Could they have let the Beaufon daub overboil, she wondered, pray heaven not, when the great clangour of the gong announced solemnly, authoritatively, that all those scattered about, in attics, in bedrooms, on little perches of their own, reading, writing, putting the last smooth to their hair, or fastening dresses, must leave all that, and the little odds and ends on their washing tables and dressing tables, and the novels on the bed tables, and the diaries which were so private, and assemble in the dining room for dinner. End of section six. Section seven of To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. Chapter seventeen. But what have I done with my life? thought Mrs. Ramsay, taking her place at the head of the table, and looking at all the plates making white circles on it. "'William, sit by me,' she said. "'Lily,' she said, wearily, "'over there.' They had that, Paul Rayleigh and Minter Doyle, she, only this, an infinitely long table and plates and knives. At the far end was her husband, sitting down, all in a heap, frowning. What at? She did not know. She did not mind. She could not understand how she had ever felt any emotion or affection for him. She had a sense of being past everything, through everything, out of everything, as she held the soup, as if there was an eddy, there, and one could be in it, or one could be out of it, and she was out of it. It's all come to an end, she thought, while they came in one after another. Charles Tansley. Sit there, please, she said. Augustus Carmichael, and sat down. And meanwhile she waited, passively, for someone to answer her, for something to happen. But this is not a thing, she thought, ladling out soup, that one says. Raising her eyebrows at the discrepancy, that was what she was thinking, this was what she was doing, ladling out soup. She felt, more and more strongly, outside that eddy, or as if a shade had fallen and robbed of colour, she saw things truly. The room, she looked round it, was very shabby. There was no beauty anywhere. She forbore to look at Mr. Tansley. Nothing seemed to have merged. They all sat separate. And the whole effort of merging and flowing and creating rested on her. Again she felt, as a fact without hostility, the sterility of men, for if she did not do it, nobody would do it. And so, giving herself a little shake that one gives a watch that has stopped, the old familiar pulse began beating, as the watch begins ticking. One, two, three, one, two, three. And so on, and so on, she repeated, listening to it, sheltering and fostering the still feeble pulse, as one might guard a weak flame with a newspaper. And so then, she concluded, addressing herself by bending silently in his direction to William Banks, poor man, who had no wife and no children, and dined alone in lodgings except for tonight, and in pity for him, life being now strong enough to bear her on again, she began all this business, as a sailor not without weariness sees the wind fill his sail, and yet hardly wants to be off again, and thinks how, had the ship sunk. He would have whirled round and round, and found rest on the floor of the sea. "'Did you find your letters? I told them to put them in the hall for you,' she said to William Banks. Lily Briscoe watched her drifting into that strange no-man's land, where to follow people is impossible, and yet their going inflicts such a chill on those who watch them, that they always try at least to follow them with their eyes, as one follows a fading ship, until the sails have sunk beneath the horizon. How old she looks! 
how worn she looks, Lily thought, and how remote. Then, when she turned to William Banks, smiling, it was as if the ship had turned and the sun had struck its sails again, and Lily thought, with some amusement, because she was relieved, why does she pity him? For that was the impression she gave when she told him that his letters were in the hall. Poor William Banks, she seemed to be saying, as if her own weariness had been partly pitying people, and the life in her, her resolve to live again, had been stirred by pity. And it was not true, Lily thought. It was one of those misjudgments of hers that seemed to be instinctive, and to arise from some need of her own, rather than of other people's. He is not in the least pitiable. He has his work, Lily said to herself. She remembered, all of a sudden, as if she had found a treasure, that she had her work. In a flash she saw her picture, and thought, yes, I shall put the tree further in the middle, then I shall avoid that awkward space. That's what I shall do. That's what has been puzzling me. She took up the salt cellar and put it down again on a flower pattern in the tablecloth, so as to remind herself to move the tree. It's odd that one scarcely gets anything worth having by post, yet one always wants one's letters," said Mr. Banks. What damned rot they talk, thought Charles Tansley, laying down his spoon precisely in the middle of his plate, which he had swept clean, as if, Lily thought, he sat opposite to her, with his back to the window precisely in the middle of view. He was determined to make sure of his meals. Everything about him had that meagre fixity bare unloveliness. But nevertheless, the fact remained, it was impossible to dislike anyone if one looked at them. She liked his eyes. They were blue, deep-set, frightening. "'Do you write many letters, Mr. Tansley?' asked Mrs. Ramsay, pitying him too, Lily supposed. For that was true of Mrs. Ramsay. She pitied men always as if they lacked something, women never as if they had something. He wrote to his mother, otherwise he did not suppose he wrote one letter a month," said Mr. Tansley shortly. For he was not going to talk the sort of rot these condescended to by these silly women. He had been reading in his room, and now he came down and it all seemed to him silly, superficial, flimsy. Why did they dress? He had come down in his ordinary clothes. He had not got any dress clothes. One never gets anything worth having by post. That was the sort of thing they were always saying. They made men say that sort of thing. Yes, it was pretty well true, he thought. They never got anything worth having from one year's end to another. They did nothing but talk, 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 eat, eat, eat. It was the women's fault. Women made civilization impossible with all their charm, all their silliness. "'No going to the lighthouse tomorrow, Mrs. Ramsay,' he said, asserting himself. He liked her. He admired her. He still thought of the man in the drain-pipe looking up at her, but he felt it necessary to assert himself. He was really, Lily Briscoe thought, in spite of his eyes, but then look at his nose, look at his hands, the most uncharming human being she had ever met. Then why did she mind what he said? Women can't write, women can't paint. What did that matter coming from him? Since clearly it was not true to him, but for some reason helpful to him, and that was why he said it. Why did her whole being bow, like corn under a wind, and erect itself again from this abasement only with a great and rather painful effort? She must make it once more. There's the sprig on the tablecloth, there's my painting. I must move the tree to the middle. That matters, nothing else. Could she not hold fast to that, she asked herself, and not lose her temper, and not argue, and if she wanted revenge, take it by laughing at him? Oh, Mr. Tansley, she said, do take me to the lighthouse with you. I should so love it. She was telling lies he could see. She was saying what she did not mean to annoy him for some reason. She was laughing at him. He was in his old flannel trousers. He had no others. He felt very rough and isolated and lonely. 
He knew that she was trying to tease him for some reason. She didn't want to go to the lighthouse with him. She despised him. So did Prue Ramsey. So did they all. But he was not going to be made a fool of by women, so he turned deliberately in his chair and looked out of the window, and said, all in a jerk, very rudely, it would be too rough for her tomorrow. She would be sick. It annoyed him that she should have made him speak like that, with Mrs. Ramsay listening. If only he could be alone in his room, working, he thought, among his books. That was where he felt at his ease. And he had never run a penny into debt. He had never cost his father a penny since he was fifteen. He had helped them at home out of his savings. He was educating his sister. Still, he wished he had known how to answer Miss Briscoe properly. He wished it had not come out all in a jerk like that. You'd be sick. He wished he could think of something to say to Mrs. Ramsay, something which would show her that he was not just a dry prig. That was what they all thought about him. He turned to her. But Mrs. Ramsay was talking about people he had never heard of to William Banks. "'Yes, take it away,' she said briefly, interrupting what she was saying to William Banks to speak to the maid. "'It must have been fifteen, no, twenty years ago, that I last saw her,' she was saying, turning back to him again as if she could not lose a moment of their talk, for she was absorbed by what they were saying. So he had actually heard from her this evening. And was Carrie still living at Marlow, and was everything still the same? Oh, she could remember it as if it were yesterday, on the river, feeling it as if it were yesterday, going on the river, feeling very cold. But if the Mannings made a plan, they stuck to it. Never should she forget Herbert killing a wasp with a teaspoon on the bank. And it was still going on, Mrs. Ramsay mused gliding like a ghost among the chairs and tables of that drawing-room on the banks of the Thames where she had been so very, very cold twenty years ago. But now she went among them like a ghost, and it fascinated her, as if, while she had changed, that particular day, now become very still and beautiful, had remained there all these years. Had Carrie written to him herself? she asked. Yes. She says they're building a new billiard-room he said. No, no, that was out of the question. Building a new billiard-room. It seemed to her impossible. Mr. Banks could not see that there was anything very odd about it. They were very well off now. Should he give her love to carry? Oh, said Mrs. Ramsay with a little start. No, she added, reflecting that she did not know this Carrie who built a new billiard-room. But how strange, she repeated to Mr. Banks's amusement, that they should be going on there still. For it was extraordinary to think that they had been capable of going on living all these years, when she had not thought of them more than once all that time. How eventful her own life had been during those same years. Yet perhaps Carrie Manning had not thought about her either. The thought was strange and distasteful. "'People soon drift apart,' said Mr. Banks feeling, however, some satisfaction, when he thought that after all he knew both the Mannings and the Ramses. He had not drifted apart, he thought, laying down his spoon and wiping his clean-shaven lips punctiliously. But perhaps he was rather unusual, he thought, in this. He never let himself get into a groove. He had friends in all circles. Mrs. Ramsay had to break off here to tell the maid something about keeping food hot. That was why he preferred dining alone. All those interruptions annoyed him. Well, thought William Banks, preserving a demeanour of exquisite courtesy, and merely spreading the fingers of his left hand on the tablecloth, as a mechanic examines a tool beautifully polished and ready for use in an interval of leisure. Such are the sacrifices one's friends ask of one. It would have hurt her if he had refused to come. But it was not worth it for him. Looking at his hand, he thought that, if he had been alone, dinner would have been almost over now, he would have been free to work. Yes, he thought, it is a terrible waste of time. The children were dropping in still. I wish one of you would run up to Roger's room, Mrs. Ramsay was saying. How trifling it all is, how boring it all is, he thought, 
compared with the other thing, work. Here he sat drumming his fingers on the tablecloth when he might have been. He took a flashing bird's-eye view of his work. What a waste of time it all was, to be sure. Yet, he thought, she is one of my oldest friends. I am by way of being devoted to her. Yet now, at this moment, her presence meant absolutely nothing to him. Her beauty meant nothing to him. Her sitting with her little boy at the window, nothing, nothing. He wished only to be alone and to take up that book. He felt uncomfortable. He felt treacherous, that he could sit by her side and feel nothing for her. The truth was that he did not enjoy family life. It was in this sort of state that one asked oneself, what does one live for? Why, one asked oneself, does one take all these pains for the human race to go on? Is it so very desirable? Are we attractive as a species? Not so very, he thought, looking at those rather untidy boys. His favourite, Cam, was in bed, he supposed. Foolish questions, vain questions, questions one never asked if one was occupied. Is human life this? Is human life that? One never had time to think about it. But here he was asking himself that sort of question, because Mrs. Ramsay was giving orders to servants, and also because it had struck him, thinking how surprised Mrs. Ramsay was that Carrie Mannings should still exist, that friendships, even the best of them, are frail things. One drifts apart. He reproached himself again. He was sitting beside Mrs. Ramsay, and he had nothing in the world to say to her. "'I'm so sorry,' said Mrs. Ramsay, turning to him at last. He felt rigid and barren, like a pair of boots that have been soaked and gone dry so that you can hardly force your feet into them. Yet he must force his feet into them. He must make himself talk. Unless he were very careful, she would find out this treachery of his, that he did not care a straw for her, and that would not be at all pleasant, he thought. So he bent his head courteously in her direction. "'How you must test dining in this bear garden,' she said, making use, as she did when she was distracted, of her social manner. So, when there is a strife of tongues, at some meeting, the chairman, to obtain unity, suggests that everyone shall speak in French. Perhaps it is bad French. French may not contain the words that express the speaker's thoughts. Nevertheless, speaking French imposes some order, some uniformity. Replying to her in the same language, Mr. Banks said, No, not at all. And Mr. Tansley, who had no knowledge of this language, even spoke thus in words of one syllable, at once suspected its insincerity. They did talk nonsense, he thought, the Ramses, and he pounced on this fresh instance with joy, making a note which, one of these days, he would read aloud to one or two friends. There, in a society where one could say what one liked, he would sarcastically describe staying with the Ramses, and what nonsense they talked. It was worth while doing it once, he would say, but not again. The women bored one so, he would say. Of course Ramsay had dished himself by marrying a beautiful woman and having eight children. It would shape itself something like that, but now, at this moment, sitting stuck there with an empty seat beside him, nothing had shaped itself at all. It was all in scraps and fragments. He felt extremely, even physically, uncomfortable. He wanted somebody to give him a chance of asserting himself. He wanted it so urgently that he fidgeted in his chair, looked at this person, then at that person, tried to break into their talk, opened his mouth and shut it again. They were talking about the fishing industry. Why did nobody ask him his opinion? What did they know about the fishing industry? Lily Briscoe knew all that. Sitting opposite him, could she not see, as in an X-ray photograph, the ribs and thigh bones of the young man's desire to impress himself, lying dark in the mist of his flesh, that thin mist which convention had laid over his burning desire to break into the conversation. 
But, she thought, screwing up her Chinese eyes and remembering how he sneered at women, can't paint, can't write. Why should I help him relieve himself? There is a code of behaviour, she knew, whose seventh article, it may be, says that on occasions of this sort it behoves the woman, whatever her own occupation might be, to go to the help of the young man opposite, so that he may expose and relieve the thigh bones, the ribs of his vanity, of his urgent desire to assert himself. As indeed it is their duty, she reflected, in her old maidenly fairness, to help us, suppose the tube were to burst into flames. Then, she thought, I should certainly expect Mr. Tansley to get me out. But how would it be, she thought, if neither of us did either of those things? So she sat there, smiling. "'You're not planning to go to the lighthouse, are you, Lily?' said Mrs. Ramsay. "'Remember poor Mr. Langley? He had been round the world dozens of times, but he told me he never suffered as he did when my husband took him there. Are you a good sailor, Mr. Tansley?' she asked. Mr. Tansley raised a hammer, swung it high in air, but realising, as it descended, that he could not smite that butterfly with such an instrument as this, said only that he had never been sick in his life. But in that one sentence lay compact, like gunpowder, that his grandfather was a fisherman, his father a chemist, that he had worked his way up entirely himself, that he was proud of it, that he was Charles Tansley, a fact that nobody there seemed to realise, but one of these days every single person would know it. He scowled ahead of him. He could almost pity these mild, cultivated people, who would be blown sky-high like bales of wool and barrels of apples, one of these days by the gunpowder that was in him. "'Will you take me, Mr. Tansley?' said Lily quickly, kindly. For of course, if Mrs. Ramsay said to her, as in effect she did, I am drowning, my dear, in seas of fire. Unless you apply some balm to the anguish of this hour, and say something nice to that young man there, life will run upon the rocks. Indeed I hear the grating and the growling at this minute. My nerves are as taut as fiddle-strings. Another touch and they will snap." When Mrs. Ramsay said all this, as the glance in her eyes said it, of course, for the hundred and fiftieth time, Lily Briscoe had to renounce the experiment. What happens if one is not nice to that young man there? And be nice. Judging the turn in her mood correctly, that she was friendly to him now, he was relieved of his egotism, and told her how he had been thrown out of a boat when he was a baby, how his father used to fish him out with a boat hook, that was how he had learned to swim. One of his uncles kept the light on some rock or other off the Scottish coast, he said. He had been there with him in a storm. This was said loudly in a pause. They had to listen to him when he said that he had been with his uncle in a lighthouse in a storm. Ah, thought Lily Briscoe, as the conversation took this auspicious turn, and she felt Mrs. Ramsay's gratitude, for Mrs. Ramsay was free now to talk for a moment herself. Ah, she thought. But what haven't I paid to get it for you?" She had not been sincere. She had done the usual trick, been nice. She would never know him. He would never know her. Human relations were all like that, she thought, and the worst, if it had not been for Mr. Banks, were between men and women. Inevitably these were extremely insincere, she thought. Then her eye caught the salt cellar which she had placed there to remind her, and she remembered that next morning she would move the tree further towards the middle, and her spirits rose so high at the thought of painting tomorrow that she laughed out loud at what Mr. Tansley was saying. Let him talk all night if he liked it. "'But how long do they leave men on a lighthouse?' she asked. He told her. He was amazingly well informed. And, as he was grateful, and as he liked her, and as he was beginning to enjoy himself. So now, Mrs. Ramsay thought, she could return to that dreamland, that unreal but fascinating place, the Manning's drawing-room at Marlow twenty years ago, where one moved about without haste or anxiety, for there was no future to worry about. She knew what had happened to them, what to her. It was like reading a good book again, 
for she knew the end of that story, since it had happened twenty years ago, and life, which shot down even from this dining-room table in cascades, heaven knows where, was sealed up there, and lay, like a lake, placidly between its banks. He said they had built a billiard-room. Was it possible? Would William go on talking about the Mannings? She wanted him to. But no, for some reason he was no longer in the mood. She tried. He did not respond. She could not force him. She was disappointed. The children are disgraceful, she said, sighing. He said something about punctuality being one of the minor virtues which we do not acquire until later in life. If at all, said Mrs. Ramsay, merely to fill up space, thinking what an old maid William was becoming. Conscious of his treachery, conscious of her wish to talk about something more intimate, yet out of mood for it at present, he felt come over him the disagreeableness of life, sitting there, waiting. Perhaps the others were saying something interesting. What were they saying? That the fishing season was bad, that the men were emigrating. They were talking about wages and unemployment. The young man was abusing the government. William Banks, thinking what a relief it was to catch on to something of this sort when private life was disagreeable, heard him say something about one of the most scandalous acts of the present government. Lily was listening. Mrs. Ramsay was listening. They were all listening. But, already bored, Lily felt that something was lacking. Mr. Banks felt that something was lacking. Pulling her shawl round her, Mrs. Ramsay felt that something was lacking. All of them bending themselves to listen, thought, Pray heaven that the inside of my mind may not be exposed. For each thought, the others are feeling this. They are outraged and indignant with the government about the fishermen, whereas I feel nothing at all. But perhaps, thought Mr. Banks, as he looked at Mr. Tansley, here is the man. One was always waiting for the man. There was always a chance. At any moment the leader might arise, the man of genius, in politics as in anything else. Probably he will be extremely disagreeable to us old fogies thought Mr. Banks, doing his best to make allowances, for he knew by some curious physical sensation, as of nerves erect in his spine, that he was jealous, for himself partly, partly more probably for his work, for his point of view, for his science, and therefore he was not entirely open-minded or altogether fair, for Mr. Tansley seemed to be saying, you have wasted your lives, you are all of you wrong. Poor old fogies, you're hopelessly behind the times. He seemed to be rather cocksure, this young man, and his manners were bad. But Mr. Banks bade himself observe. He had courage. He had ability. He was extremely well up in the facts. Probably, Mr. Banks thought, as Tansley abused the government, there is a good deal in what he says. Tell me now, he said. So they argued about politics, and Lily looked at the leaf on the tablecloth, and Mrs. Ramsay, leaving the argument entirely in the hands of the two men, wondered why she was so bored by this talk, and wished, looking at her husband at the other end of the table, that he would say something. One word, she said to herself, for if he said a thing it would make all the difference. He went to the heart of things. He cared about fishermen and their wages. He could not sleep for thinking of them. It was altogether different when he spoke. One did not feel then, pray heaven you don't see how little I care, because one did care. Then, realizing that it was because she admired him so much that she was waiting for him to speak, she felt as if somebody had been praising her husband to her and her marriage and she glowed all over without realising that it was she herself who had praised him. She looked at him, thinking to find this in his face, he would be looking magnificent. But not in the least. He was screwing his face up, he was scowling and frowning and flushing with anger. What on earth was it about? she wondered. What could be the matter? Oh 
only that poor old Augustus had asked for another plate of soup, that was all. It was unthinkable, it was detestable, so he signalled to her across the table, that Augustus should be beginning his soup over again. He loathed people eating when he had finished. She saw his anger fly like a pack of hounds into his eyes, his brow, and she knew that in a moment something violent would explode, and then, thank goodness, she saw him clutch himself and clap a brake on the wheel, and the whole of his body seemed to emit sparks, but not words. He sat there scowling. He had said nothing. He would have her observe. Let her give him the credit for that. But why, after all, should poor Augustus not ask for another plate of soup? He had merely touched Ellen's arm and said, "'Ellen, please, another plate of soup.' And then Mr. Ramsay scowled like that. "'And why not?' Mrs. Ramsay demanded. Surely they could let Augustus have his soup if he wanted it. He hated people wallowing in food, Mr. Ramsay frowned at her. He hated everything dragging on for hours like this. But he had controlled himself, Mr. Ramsay would have her observe, disgusting though the sight was. But why show it so plainly, Mrs. Ramsay demanded. They looked at each other down the long table, sending these questions and answers across, each knowing exactly what the other felt. Everybody could see, Mrs. Ramsay thought. There was Rose gazing at her father, there was Roger gazing at his father. Both would be off in spasms of laughter in another second, she knew. And so she said promptly, indeed it was time, "'Light the candles!' And they jumped up instantly and went and fumbled at the sideboard. Why could he never conceal his feelings, Mrs. Ramsay wondered, and she wondered if Augustus Carmichael had noticed. Perhaps he had, perhaps he had not. She could not help respecting the composure with which he sat there, drinking his soup. If he wanted soup, he asked for soup. Whether people laughed at him, or were angry with him, he was the same. He did not like her, she knew that, but partly for that very reason she respected him, and looking at him, drinking soup, very large and calm in the failing light, and monumental and contemplative. She wondered what he did feel then and why he was always content and dignified, and she thought how devoted he was to Andrew, and would call him into his room, and Andrew said, show him things. And there he would lie all day long on the lawn, brooding, presumably, over his poetry, till he reminded one of a cat watching birds, and then he clapped his paws together when he had found the word, and her husband said, poor old Augustus, he's a true poet which was high praise from her husband. Now eight candles were stood down the table, and after the first stoop the flames stood upright and drew with them into visibility the long table entire, and in the middle a yellow and purple dish of fruit. What had she done with it? Mrs. Ramsay wondered, for Rose's arrangement of the grapes and pears, of the horny pink-lined shell, of the bananas, made her think of a trophy fetched from the bottom of the sea, of Neptune's banquet, of the bunch that hangs with vine leaves over the shoulder of Bacchus, in some picture, among the leopard skins and the torches lolloping red and gold. Thus brought up suddenly into the light, it seemed possessed of great size and depth, it was like a world in which one could take one's staff and climb hills, she thought, and go down into valleys, and to her pleasure, for it brought them into sympathy momentarily. She saw that Augustus too feasted his eyes on the same plate of fruit, plunged in, broke off a bloom here, a tassel there, and returned, after feasting, to his hive. That was his way of looking, different from hers, but looking together united them. End of section 7 Section 8 of To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf Chapter 17 Continued Now all the candles were lit up, and the faces on both sides of the table were brought nearer by the candlelight, and composed, as they had not been in the twilight, into a party round a table, for the night was now shut off by panes of glass, which, 
far from giving any accurate view of the outside world, rippled it so strangely that here, inside the room, seemed to be order and dry land. There, outside, a reflection in which things waved and vanished waterily. Some change at once went through them all, as if this had really happened, and they were all conscious of making a party together in a hollow on an island, had their common cause against that fluidity out there. Mrs. Ramsay, who had been uneasy, waiting for Paul and Minta to come in, and unable, she felt, to settle to things, now felt her uneasiness changed to expectation. For now they must come, and Lily Briscoe, trying to analyse the cause of the sudden exhilaration, compared it with that moment on the tennis lawn, when solidity suddenly vanished, and such vast spaces lay between them, and now the same effect was got by the many candles in the sparely furnished room, and the uncurtained windows, and the bright, mask-like look of faces seen by candlelight. Some weight was taken off them. Anything might happen, she felt. They must come now, Mrs. Ramsay thought, looking at the door. And, at that instant, Minta Doyle, Paul Rayleigh, and a maid carrying a great dish in her hands came in together. They were awfully late. They were horribly late, Minta said, as they found their way to different ends of the table. I lost my brooch, my grandmother's brooch, said Minta, with a sound of lamentation in her voice, and a suffusion in her large brown eyes, looking down, looking up as she sat by Mr. Ramsay, which roused his chivalry so that he bantered her. How could she be such a goose, he asked, as to scramble about the rocks in jewels? She was by way of being terrified of him. He was so fearfully clever, and the first night when she had sat by him, and he talked about George Eliot, she had been really frightened, for she had left the third volume of Middlemarch in the train, and she never knew what happened in the end. But afterwards she got on perfectly, and made herself out even more ignorant than she was, because he liked telling her she was a fool. And so tonight, directly he laughed at her, she was not frightened. Besides, she knew, directly she came into the room, that the miracle had happened, she wore her golden haze. Sometimes she had it, sometimes not. She never knew why it came or why it went or if she had it until she came into the room, and then she knew instantly by the way some man looked at her. Yes, tonight she had it, tremendously. She knew that by the way Mr. Ramsay told her not to be a fool. She sat beside him, smiling. It must have happened then, thought Mrs. Ramsay. They are engaged. And for a moment she felt what she had never expected to feel again. Jealousy. For he, her husband, felt it too, Minta's glow. He liked these girls, these golden reddish girls, with something flying, something a little wild and harem scarum about them, who didn't scrape their hair off, weren't, as he said about poor Lily Briscoe, skimpy. There was some quality which she herself had not, some lustre, some richness, which attracted him, amused him led him to make favourites of girls like Minta. They might cut his hair from him, plait him watch-chains, or interrupt him at his work, hailing him. She heard them. "'Come along, Mr. Ramsay. It's our turn to beat them now.' And out he came to play tennis. But indeed she was not jealous. Only, now and then, when she made herself look in her glass, a little resentful that she had grown old, perhaps by her own fault. The bill for the greenhouse and all the rest of it. She was grateful to them for laughing at him. How many pipes have you smoked today, Mr. Ramsay? And so on. Till he seemed a young man, a man very attractive to women, not burdened, not weighed down with the greatness of his labours and the sorrows of the world and his fame or his failure. But again as she had first known him, gaunt but gallant, helping her out of a boat, she remembered, with delightful ways, like that. She looked at him, and he looked astonishingly young, teasing Minta. For herself, 
Put it down there, she said, helping the Swiss girl to place gently before her the huge brown pot in which was the Buffon daub. For her own part, she liked her boobies. Paul must sit by her. She had kept a place for him. Really, she sometimes thought she liked the boobies best. They did not bother one with their dissertations. How much they missed, after all, these very clever men! How dried up they did become, to be sure! There was something, she thought as he sat down, very charming about Paul. His manners were delightful to her, and his sharp-cut nose and his bright blue eyes. He was so considerate. Would he tell her, now that they were all talking again, what had happened? We went back to look for Minter's brooch, he said, sitting down by her. We. That was enough. She knew from the effort, the rise in his voice to surmount a difficult word, that it was the first time he had said we. We did this, we did that. They'll say that all their lives, she thought, and an exquisite scent of olives and oil and juice rose from the great brown dish as Martha, with a little flourish, took the cover off. The cook had spent three days over that dish. And she must take great care, Mrs. Ramsay thought, diving into the soft mass, to choose a specially tender piece for William Banks. And she peered into the dish, with its shiny walls and its confusion of savoury brown and yellow meats, and its bay leaves and its wine, and thought, this will celebrate the occasion. A curious sense rising in her, at once freakish and tender, of celebrating a festival, as if two emotions were called up in her, one profound, for what could be more serious than the love of man for woman, what more commanding, more impressive, bearing in its bosom the seeds of death. At the same time these lovers, these people entering into illusion glittering-eyed, must be danced round with mockery, decorated with garlands. "'It is a triumph,' said Mr. Banks, laying his knife down for a moment. He had eaten attentively. It was rich, it was tender, it was perfectly cooked. How did she manage these things in the depths of the country? he asked her. She was a wonderful woman. All his love, all his reverence, had returned, and she knew it. It is a French recipe of my grandmother's, said Mrs. Ramsay, speaking with a ring of great pleasure in her voice. Of course it was French. What passes for cookery in England is an abomination, they agreed. It is putting cabbages in water. It is roasting meat till it is like leather. It is cutting off the delicious skins of vegetables. In which, said Mr. Banks, all the virtue of the vegetable is contained. And the waste, said Mrs. Ramsay. A whole French family could live on what an English cook throws away. Spurred on by her sense that William's affection had come back to her, and that everything was all right again, and that her suspense was over, and that now she was free to both triumph and to mock, she laughed, she gesticulated, till Lily thought, how childlike, how absurd she was, sitting up there with all her beauty opened in her again, talking about the skins of vegetables. There was something frightening about her. She was irresistible. Always she got her own way in the end, Lily thought. Now she had brought this off. Paul and Minter, one might suppose, were engaged. Mr. Banks was dining here. She put a spell on them all, by wishing, so simply, so directly. And Lily contrasted that abundance with her own poverty of spirit, and supposed that it was partly that belief, for her face was all lit up. Without looking young, she looked radiant. In this strange, this terrifying thing, which made Paul Rayleigh, sitting at her side, all of a tremor, yet abstract, absorbed, silent. Mrs. Ramsay, Lily felt, as she talked about the skins of vegetables, exalted that, worshipped that, held her hands over it to warm them, to protect it, and yet, having brought it all about, somehow laughed, led her victims, Lily felt, to the altar. It came over her too now, the emotion, the 
vibration of love. How inconspicuous she felt herself by Paul's side. He glowing, burning, she aloof, satirical. He bound for adventure, she moored to the shore. He launched, incautious, she solitary, left out, and ready to implore a share, if it were a disaster, in his disaster. She said shyly, When did Minta lose her brooch? He smiled the most exquisite smile, veiled by memory, tinged by dreams. He shook his head. On the beach, he said. I'm going to find it, he said. I'm getting up early. This being kept secret from Minta, he lowered his voice and turned his eyes to where she sat, laughing, beside Mr. Ramsay. Lily wanted to protest violently and outrageously her desire to help him, envisaging how in the dawn on the beach she would be the one to pounce on the brooch, half hidden by some stone, and thus herself be included among the sailors and adventurers. But what did he reply to her offer? She actually said with an emotion that she seldom let appear, "'Let me come with you,' and he laughed. He meant yes or no, either perhaps. But it was not his meaning. It was the odd chuckle he gave, as if he had said, "'Throw yourself over the cliff, if you like. I don't care.' He turned on her cheek the heat of love, its horror, its cruelty, its unscrupulosity. It scorched her, and Lily, looking at Minta, being charming to Mr. Ramsay at the other end of the table, flinched for her exposed to these fangs, and was thankful. For at any rate, she said to herself, catching sight of the salt cellar on the pattern, she need not marry, thank heaven, she need not undergo that degradation. She was saved from that dilution. She would move the tree rather more to the middle. Such was the complexity of things. For what happened to her, especially staying with the Ramses, was to be made to feel violently two opposite things at the same time. That's what you feel, was one. That's what I feel, was the other. And then they fought together in her mind, as now. It is so beautiful, so exciting, this love, that I tremble on the verge of it, and offer, quite out of my own habit, to look for a brooch on a beach. Also it is the stupidest, the most barbaric of human passions, and turns a nice young man with a profile like a gem's. Paul's was exquisite into a bully with a crowbar. He was swaggering, he was insolent, in the Mile End Road. Yet, she said to herself, from the dawn of time odes have been sung to love, wreaths heaped and roses, and if you asked nine people out of ten, they would say they wanted nothing but this, love. While the women, judging from her own experience, would all the time be feeling, this is not what we want, there is nothing more tedious, puerile, and inhumane than this. Yet it is also beautiful and necessary. Well then, well then, she asked, somehow expecting the others to go on with the argument, as if in an argument like this one threw one's own little bolt, which fell short, obviously, and left the others to carry it on. So she listened again to what they were saying, in case they should throw any light upon the question of love. Then, said Mr. Banks, there is that liquid the English call coffee. Oh, coffee, said Mrs. Ramsay. But it was much rather a question. She was thoroughly roused, Lily could see, and talked very emphatically, of real butter and clean milk. Speaking with warmth and eloquence, she described the iniquity of the English dairy system, and in what state milk was delivered at the door and was about to prove her charges, for she had gone into the matter, when all round the table, beginning with Andrew in the middle, like a fire leaping from tuft to tuft of furs, her children laughed, her husband laughed, she was laughed at, fire encircled, and forced to veil her crest, dismount her batteries, and only retaliate by displaying the raillery and ridicule of the table to Mr. Banks, as an example of what one suffered if one attacked the prejudices of the British public. 
purposely, however, for she had it on her mind that Lily, who had helped her with Mr. Tansley, was out of things. She exempted her from the rest, said, Lily anyhow agrees with me, and so drew her in, a little fluttered, a little startled, for she was thinking about love. They were both out of things, Mrs. Ramsay had been thinking, both Lily and Charles Tansley. Both suffered from the glow of the other two. He, it was clear, felt himself utterly in the cold. No woman would look at him with Paul Rayleigh in the room. Poor fellow. Still, he had his dissertation, the influence of somebody upon something. He could take care of himself. With Lily it was different. She faded under Minter's glow, became more inconspicuous than ever, in her little grey dress with her little puckered face and her little Chinese eyes. Everything about her was so small. Yet, thought Mrs. Ramsay, comparing her with Minter, as she claimed her help, for Lily should bear her out, she talked no more about her dairies than her husband did about his boots, he would talk by the hour about his boots. Of the two, Lily at forty will be the better. There was in Lily a thread of something, a flare of something, something of her own which Mrs. Ramsay liked very much indeed, but no man would, she feared. Obviously, not unless it were a much older man, like William Banks. But then he cared—well, Mrs. Ramsay sometimes thought that he cared, since his wife's death, perhaps for her. He was not in love, of course. It was one of those unclassified affections, of which there are so many. Oh, but nonsense, she thought. William must marry Lily. They have so many things in common. Lily is so fond of flowers. They are both cold and aloof, and rather self-sufficing. She must arrange for them to take a long walk together. Foolishly, she had set them opposite each other. That could be remedied tomorrow. If it were fine, they should go for a picnic. Everything seemed possible. Everything seemed right. Just now. But this cannot last, she thought, dissociating herself from the moment while they were all talking about boots. Just now she had reached security. She hovered like a hawk suspended, like a flag floated in an element of joy which filled every nerve of her body fully and sweetly, not noisily, solemnly rather, for it arose, she thought, looking at them all eating there, from husband and children and friends, all of which rising in this profound stillness. She was helping William Banks to one very small piece more, and peered into the depths of the earthenware pot, seemed now, for no special reason, to stay there like a smoke like a fume rising upwards, holding them safe together. Nothing need be said, nothing could be said. There it was, all round them. It partook, she felt, carefully helping Mr. Banks to a specially tender piece, of eternity, as she had already felt about something different once before that afternoon. There is a coherence in things, a stability. Something, she meant, is immune from change, and shines out, she glanced at the window with its ripple of reflected lights, in the face of the flowing, the fleeting, the spectral, like a ruby. So that again tonight she had the feeling she had had once today, already, of peace, of rest. Of such moments, she thought, the thing is made that endures. Yes she assured William Banks. There is plenty for everybody. Andrew, she said, hold your plate lower or I shall spill it. The boeuf on daub was a perfect triumph. Here, she felt, putting the spoon down, where one could move or rest, could wait now, they were all helped, listening, could then, like a hawk which lapses suddenly from its high station, flaunt and sink on laughter easily, resting her whole weight upon what at the other end of the table her husband was saying about the square root of 1,253. That was the number, it seemed, on his watch. What did it all mean? To this day she had no notion. A square root, 
What was that? Her sons knew. She leant on them, on cubes and square roots. That was what they were talking about now. On Voltaire and Madame de Stael. On the character of Napoleon. On the French system of land tenure. On Lord Rosebery. On Creevy's memoirs. She let it uphold her and sustain her, this admirable fabric of the masculine intelligence, which ran up and down, crossed this way and that, like iron girders spanning the swaying fabric, upholding the world, so that she could trust herself to it utterly, even shut her eyes, or flicker them for a moment, as a child staring up from its pillow winks at the myriad layers of the leaves of a tree. Then she woke up. It was still being fabricated. William Banks was praising the Waverley novels. He read one of them every six months, he said. And why should that make Charles Tansley angry? He rushed in. All, thought Mrs. Ramsay, because Prue will not be nice to him, and denounced the Waverley novels when he knew nothing about it, nothing about it whatsoever, Mrs. Ramsay thought, observing him rather than listening to what he said. She could see how it was from his manner. He wanted to assert himself, and so it would always be with him, till he got his professorship or married his wife, and so need not always be saying, I, I, I. For that was what his criticism of poor Sir Walter, or perhaps it was Jane Austen, amounted to. I, I, I. He was thinking of himself and the impression he was making, as she could tell by the sound of his voice, and his emphasis and his uneasiness. Success would be good for him. At any rate, they were off again. Now she need not listen. It could not last, she knew, but at the moment her eyes were so clear that they seemed to go round the table unveiling each of these people, and their thoughts and their feelings, without effort like a light stealing under water, so that its ripples and the reeds in it and the minnows balancing themselves, and the sudden silent trout, are all lit up, hanging, trembling. So she saw them, she heard them, but whatever they said had also this quality, as if what they said was like the movement of a trout, when, at the same time, one can see the ripple and the gravel, something to the right, something to the left and the whole is held together. For whereas in active life she would be netting and separating one thing from another, she would be saying she liked the Waverley novels, or had not read them, she would be urging herself forward. Now she said nothing. For the moment she hung suspended. "'Ah, but how long do you think it'll last?' said somebody. It was as if she had antennae trembling out from her which, intercepting certain sentences, forced them upon her attention. This was one of them. She scented danger for her husband. A question like that would lead, almost certainly, to something being said which reminded him of his own failure. How long would he be read, he would think at once. William Banks, who was entirely free from all such vanity, laughed and said he attached no importance to changes in fashion. Who could tell what was going to last, in literature or indeed in anything else? Let us enjoy what we do enjoy, he said. His integrity seemed to Mrs. Ramsay quite admirable. He never seemed for a moment to think, but how does this affect me? But then if you had the other temperament, which must have praise, which must have encouragement, Naturally you began, and she knew that Mr. Ramsay was beginning, to be uneasy, to want somebody to say, oh, but your work will last, Mr. Ramsay, or something like that. He showed his uneasiness quite clearly now by saying, with some irritation, that anyhow Scott, or was it Shakespeare, would last him his lifetime. He said it irritably. Everybody, she thought, felt a little uncomfortable, without knowing why. Then Minter Doyle, whose instinct was fine, said bluffly, absurdly, that she did not believe that anyone really enjoyed reading Shakespeare. Mr. Ramsay said grimly, but his mind was turned away again, 
that very few people liked it as much as they said they did. But, he added, there is considerable merit in some of the plays nevertheless, and Mrs. Ramsay saw that it would be all right for the moment anyhow. He would laugh at Minter, and she, Mrs. Ramsay saw, realising his extreme anxiety about himself, would, in her own way, see that he was taken care of, and praise him somehow or other. But she wished it was not necessary. Perhaps it was her fault that it was necessary. Anyhow, she was free now to listen to what Paul Rayleigh was trying to say about books one had read as a boy. They lasted, he said. He had read some of Tolstoy at school. There was one he always remembered, but he had forgotten the name. Russian names were impossible, said Mrs. Ramsay. Vronsky, said Paul. He remembered that because he always thought it such a good name for a villain. Vronsky, said Mrs. Ramsay. Oh, Anna Karenina. But that did not take them very far. Books were not in their line. No, Charles Tansley would put them both right in a second about books. But it was all so mixed up with, am I saying the right thing? Am I making a good impression? That, after all, one knew more about him than about Tolstoy. Whereas what Paul said was about the thing, simply, not himself, nothing else. Like all stupid people, he had a kind of modesty too, a consideration for what you were feeling, which, once in a way at least, she found attractive. Now he was thinking, not about himself, or about Tolstoy, but whether she was cold, whether she felt a draught, whether she would like a pear. No, she said, she did not want a pear. Indeed she had been keeping guard over the dish of fruit, without realising it, jealously, hoping that nobody would touch it. Her eyes had been going in and out among the curves and shadows of the fruit, among the rich purples of the lowland grapes, then over the horny ridge of the shell, putting a yellow against a purple, a curved shape against a round shape, without knowing why she did it, or why, every time she did it, she felt more and more serene, until, oh what a pity that they should do it, a hand reached out, took a pair, and spoilt the whole thing. In sympathy she looked at Rose. She looked at Rose sitting between Jasper and Prue. How odd that one's child should do that! How odd to see them sitting there, in a row, her children, Jasper, Rose, Prue, Andrew, almost silent, but with some joke of their own going on, she guessed, from the twitching at their lips. It was something quite apart from everything else, something they were hoarding up to laugh over in their own room. It was not about their father, she hoped. No she thought not. What was it, she wondered, sadly rather, for it seemed to her that they would laugh when she was not there. There was all that hoarded behind those rather set, still, mask-like faces, for they did not join in easily. They were like watchers, surveyors, a little raised or set apart from the grown-up people. But when she looked at Prue tonight, she saw that this was not now quite true of her. She was just beginning, just moving, just descending. The faintest light was on her face, as if the glow of Minter opposite, some excitement, some anticipation of happiness was reflected in her, as if the sun of the love of men and women rose over the rim of the tablecloth, and without knowing what it was she bent towards it and greeted it. She kept looking at Minter, shyly yet curiously so that Mrs. Ramsay looked from one to the other, and said, speaking to Prue in her own mind, "'You will be as happy as she is one of these days. "'You will be much happier,' she added, "'because you are my daughter,' she meant. "'Her own daughter must be happier than other people's daughters.' But dinner was over. It was time to go. They were only playing with things on their plates. She would wait until they had done laughing at some story her husband was telling. He was having a joke with Minter about a bet. Then she would get up. She liked Charles Tansley, she thought suddenly. She liked his laugh. 
She liked him for being so angry with Paul and Minta. She liked his awkwardness. There was a lot in that young man, after all. And Lily, she thought, putting her napkin beside her plate, she always has some joke of her own. One need never bother about Lily. She waited. She tucked her napkin under the edge of her plate. Well, were they done now? No. That story had led to another story. Her husband was in great spirits tonight, and wishing, she supposed, to make it all right with old Augustus after that scene about the soup had drawn him in. They were telling stories about someone they had both known at college. She looked at the window in which the candle flames burnt brighter now that the panes were black, and looking at that outside, the voices came to her very strangely, as if they were voices at a service in a cathedral, for she did not listen to the words. The sudden bursts of laughter, and then one voice, Minter's, speaking alone, reminded her of men and boys crying out the Latin words of a service in some Roman Catholic cathedral. She waited. Her husband spoke. He was repeating something, and she knew it was poetry from the rhythm and the ring of exultation and melancholy in his voice. Come out and climb the garden path, Luriana Lurali. The china rose is all abloom and buzzing with the yellow bee. The words, she was looking at the window, sounded as if they were floating like flowers on water out there, cut off from them all, as if no one had said them, but they had come into existence of themselves. And all the lives we ever lived, and all the lives to be, are full of trees and changing leaves. She did not know what they meant, but, like music, the words seemed to be spoken by her own voice, outside herself, saying quite easily and naturally what had been in her mind the whole evening, while she said different things. She knew, without looking round, that everyone at the table was listening to the voice, saying, I wonder if it seems to you, Luriana Lurali, with the same sort of relief and pleasure that she had, as if this were, at last, the natural thing to say, this were their own voice speaking. But the voice had stopped. She looked round. She made herself get up. Augustus Carmichael had risen, and, holding his table napkin so that it looked like a long white robe, he stood chanting. To see the kings go riding by, over lawn and daisy lee, with their palm leaves and cedar, Luriana, Lurali. And as she passed him, he turned slightly towards her, repeating the last words, Luriana, Lurali, and bowed to her as if he did her homage. Without knowing why, she felt that he liked her better than he had ever done before, and with a feeling of relief and gratitude, she returned his bow and passed through the door which he held open for her. It was necessary now to carry everything a step further. With her foot on the threshold, she waited a moment longer, in a scene which was vanishing even as she looked. And then, as she moved and took Minta's arm and left the room, it changed, it shaped itself differently. It had become, she knew, giving one last look at it over her shoulder, already the past. End of section 8